All right. I'm here to talk about uh, ES modules in Electron. Um, sorry, no. Uh, I'll do this one on web layouts, um, which will work in Electron. So that's great, because I've never actually built anything in Electron. So sorry. Um, I, I do use it every day. I scrolled down farther on the website and was like, oh, yeah, I use that one and that one and those. And yeah, OK, I use that every day. I run a full stack consulting agency called Oddbird. Um, I do a lot of CSS and uh, interface, um, you know, like front end development, but the other kind. Uh, there's also, I mean, I've seen, if you're interested, I've seen this other great talk on CSS in Electron. Um, nativize is the new normalize. Go check it out online. That's the end of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about CSS layout. Um, if you don't know, I built SUSE, which is a grid system, um, which is why I get to talk about this thing. And I'm here to tell you not to use it. Uh, the end. <laughs> cool. Any questions? Damn. All right, so we're going to go back in history. Um, 1993, we got HTML. You might have heard of it. It's a markup language. Uh, this was me starting my company in 93 with my brothers. Uh, I think we're doing a card sort there. Uh, ignore the Magic the Gathering. Um, 1997, we got tables. This was the first way that we started to do layout on the web. Lots of fun. Everybody loves tables. Uh, and if nobody's yelled it at you recently, tables are, in fact, for data. Uh, they have very limited styling options. There's not a lot you can do with them um, because they're built for laying out data. They have very strict nonlinear markup, which makes them inaccessible, which is a problem both for SEO and for your lawyers. Um, so it's just an accessibility nightmare, uh, and there's a lot of problems with that. But we all know that. We've already moved past that. Um, part of that problem is that code is communication. I quote Sarah Drasner saying that, but she always reminds me she only said it once. I just happened to be there. Um, they destroy meaning. Table layouts destroy uh, our ability to make meaning out of the code. They're, they're not semantic. They don't mean anything. Uh, and they just add confusion. In 2000, well, technically in 1996, but not in any browsers until 2000, uh, we got cascading style sheets, um, which are designed with this principle of least power. Um, that's a core design feature. So if you're worried about the lack of power. I'll show you that we have lots more power now. Um, but from the beginning, CSS was designed to have less power. And that's a feature. And that's a good thing. Um, you've all seen this. This is also a feature. If your design tool didn't allow you to do overflow, you would be pissed. So this is absolutely part of any good design language. Um, but don't be fooled. Uh, CSS has a declarative syntax, which makes it not programming to some people. Um, but it is not a static language. It has lots of dynamic power. There's a lot you can do with it. So we're going to dig into some of that. Um, part of what we want to do when building layouts, CSS is designed to establish dynamic relationships between things. Um, because we're dealing with a dynamic page, we have to have a language that is designed to create dynamic layouts. Um, so how is this interface going to change? When the content changes, when the viewport changes, when the context changes, uh, we've got all these sort of dynamic uh, variables that we don't know. And uh, we have to have a language that uh, sets up relationships so that we can handle that. Um, you've maybe seen this. This is like uh, a third of the different devices people are using to access your, well, you know, if you're using Electron, maybe it's not all of these. Cool. Um, but we're not just designing for one guy with uh, yellow hair. We're designing for all these people, and then all these people, and then all these people, uh, and all those different browsers. And we need to make it work everywhere. That's part of the vision of the web. Uh, and Electron is part of the web. Um, so one of the rules that we're going to follow always in building a layout is that we pay attention to the flow. Um, the flow goes in two directions. Uh, so here's block flow. Uh, Elements stack up in blocks uh, down the page. And we can go to an inline flow. And then they stack up next to each other. And we can mix and match those. And the nice thing about flow is we have relationships. When one thing changes, other things change. And that's great. Uh, because we're dealing with a dynamic page, 
uh, we want to keep those relationships in place. So staying in the flow helps us do that. Um, I'm going to look a little bit, keeping that in mind, at some of the classic layout techniques and how we got where we are, how we got to grid systems and SUSE, and how we got past them. Um, so the first thing, when I started using CSS, I was like, I want to do layouts. Position is probably the answer, right? That would make sense. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, when you position something relative, uh, it just moves it. This is very much like uh, what we have transforms for now. Um, but uh, it has no effect on the flow of everything around it. Uh, so that breaks our rules. Uh, the layout, using that for layout doesn't affect the flow, not useful. Position absolute, same thing. Uh, it's a little bit different. It takes it out of the flow completely. Um, not useful for layout because uh, if we did a layout entirely with absolute positioning, which I've seen people do, uh, everything uh, is, it feels like you're removing the connections between things. Uh, but in reality, you're making more connections because if you change the size of one thing, you're going to have to change the sizes and layouts of everything else uh, because all those numbers are related. So uh, absolute or fixed, they work great for overlays, things that aren't actually part of the layout that come in over top, uh, off canvas menus, drop downs, tool tips, uh, things like that that come in over top of the layout but uh, aren't part of it. So. The first thing we got that actually became useful was floats, which is a hack, um, but a fun hack. It's really great for floating things in text. That's what it's for. It does it really well. Um, but when you start to do layouts, you run into some problems. Uh, so you can see that the container around it is not moved, only the text and other floats move around it so it's sort of in the flow and sort of out of the flow uh, and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're getting close. If we really want it to work, we need a clear fix. Uh, this is a small one. You can do it as a class or a mix-in or however you like. Um, and as soon as you add the clear fix, basically we're just adding something down below that would be hidden. Um, and that makes everything, not everything, but some things clear around it. So there's different hacks. If you add overflow hidden to it, suddenly everything will float around it, which is another weird little hack um, that's super useful until you need to overflow. Um, we're getting this display flow root, uh, except that no browsers are implementing it. Um, I think it is implemented in one or two places. I didn't check whether Electron is one of those. Um, maybe worth looking into. This is the official uh, syntax for a clear fix if you want to stop using the hack. Um, the great thing about floats, the thing that I miss about them, is how flexible the markup and nesting is. When I float something, I can count on everything collapsing, and that's kind of nice if JavaScript is giving me all these extra divs, uh, nested divs that I never wanted. Um, they can just disappear because floats ignore them. Um, that was nice. Uh, unfortunately, Floats don't have a good sense of the context. They're not entirely in the flow. Um, so we end up with these explicit widths and explicit relationships um, that don't uh, flow together. So it's not the worst hack. It worked for us for a while. Um, but we had some other options. Display table came along. Some people got really excited about that. It's interesting. So here's something, some divs that are stacked up in blocks. Uh, and then when I change them to a table, uh, they lay out like a table. And it has a lot of the same limitations as uh, HTML tables in terms of styling, um, but it also does give us sort of ways of taking up space on a single line. It's one line at a time like a table would be, uh, columns and rows. Um, so some interesting power there, also some limitations, like you can't use margins on them. You have to use border padding, uh, which is not a property most people use very often. Um, but works. It's, again, not a terrible hack. Uh, around 2007 to 2010, we started getting the major grid frameworks. Um, basically, it's this. We've got 12 columns. They go in a single direction. Uh, there's no vertical grid. There's just the horizontal grid. We want to span things on that grid. So we want to take an element and say, OK, span six of our 12 columns. Um, 
And generally the way they were done, the first ones, like Blueprint I think was one of the first, uh, you add a margin on one side, usually on the right, uh, and that's your gutter. And then you have this problem at the end where you need to get rid of the gutter on the last element um, because that would be extra. Uh, and so everybody has this uh, class syntax that says, you know, column, this is a column, it's going to be 6 of 12, and this is the last one, so take off uh, that final gutter. Um, and that's nice enough. Um, classes work as an API. Classes are the main API built into CSS. If you're building an API, that's one of the ways you're going to do it. Um, uh, when 960 came along, they proposed this sort of split gutters approach where you get half a gutter on either side of the grid and you get uh, half gutters on either side of every element and they stack up to create full gutters. Um, and that was clever because suddenly we didn't have to deal with the last um, and uh, that part could go away and everything could just be consistent but still we're working in the same systems. These are nice, uh, especially at the time when we were dealing with so many hacks. These provided us with some consistent patterns to use when doing a layout. Um, and they allowed developers to ignore CSS, which is great. And also, they allowed developers to ignore CSS, which is terrible. Uh, so pluses and minuses there. Um, they also provided a sort of one-size-fits-all solution, especially at the beginning. Uh, everybody gets 12 columns. Everybody decides how to lay out on those 12 columns. With something like 960, it was even built in. The exact width that everybody should use is 960 pixels. Um, and that was the idea. So one-size-fits-all solutions uh, don't really make the web very interesting. Around that time, this is when I was actually starting my company, uh, I saw this video. This is still a talk worth watching if you write CSS. Um, there are parts of it that are out of date, but a lot of it uh, is just really smart ways of thinking about CSS. Um, this is Natalie Down gave this in Bar Camp London. Um, CSS systems, and she was proposing that rather than having one library of classes that we put on every site, we have ways of thinking about layout that we can take from one project to the next. We have similar naming conventions. So this would be like these days we talk about SMACs and BEM uh, and OOCSS, or naming conventions. So she was proposing that early on, that you figure out your own naming conventions, you figure out your way of doing layout, and take that from project to project. Part of what made this attractive to me is that this is the right system for people who are doing agency work, where we're moving quickly from one project to the next. If I was building one project over the course of 15 years, the class API, the library, might make more sense to me. So there's trade-offs there. I'm not Mailforce. Uh, I'm not InstaSlack. So, um, it's different needs for different people. There's not one right answer. Um, but I liked her system. Uh, she was basically saying systems for doing it rather than frameworks for doing it. Uh, we want fluid grids on the outside, or fluid grids in how we define everything, relationships. And then we can put static containers on them if we want to. And the nice thing was that then you can make changes quickly and say, OK, I want it bigger. And you don't have to change everything. Uh, all the internals are built fluid and just move. Um, it was a very clever system. It was sort of responsive before responsive, um, and I really liked it, but the math was really ugly. Um, and I was really sitting there with a calculator on one side of the screen and my code on the other and just copying and pasting in these numbers, and they're terrible. I have no idea what that means. Um, it all comes from this. You take the, the target, the span that you want, you divide it by the context, and you get the multiplier. And that's how all of this grid math works. Um, in SAS, you can mimic that with just percentage target divided by context. That should be simple, like one-fifth would give you one-fifth of the columns. Um, but it's not simple because gutters get in the way. Um, so gutters make it complex, and you end up with this math, uh, which I was doing. Um, and SAS came, well, SAS started to get some traction right around that time. And that's what Suzy came out of. Um, so in 2009, I made Suzy, and the basic idea was let's just take that math and make it readable. Great. Uh, you still don't want to use it. Um, the nice thing is it gives you any grid system on demand. Uh, the, the sad part is it's usually overkill. 
uh, you usually don't need it, especially now. Um, so yeah, don't use it. Have I been clear on that? <laughs> Great. Uh, so one thing that you can do now, um, I think it was around 2007 that we got uh, box sizing um, uh, to change the box model. That really allows you to move gutters to the inside of elements uh, and really simplify the math. So then your grid looks like this and you put your spacing inside um, and the math is just fractions. This is actually what uh, Nicole Sullivan do was doing in OOCSS right away, um, even before you could uh, put the padding on those elements. Um, she did it by added, adding a nested, um, a nested element to do the padding. But uh, if you fix the box model, which this is one of the things that IE got right the first time and the rest of us are catching up, um, the default box model is this. When you set width and height in CSS, you're setting the width and height of the content, and then padding is on top of that, and then border is on top of that, and then margins on top of that. And that doesn't make sense for most of the way we think about layouts. Um, it only makes sense sometimes when we're defining a container for something and we want the inner width uh, that can be useful, but not very often. Um, so this is what we really want, and now we can set it with a uh, border box um, box model, uh, and then we set the height and width, and everything is subtracted from that. Um, and that's going to be much more useful. And that allows us to set a width and then add padding, and the padding doesn't change what the width is. Um, so if you want global box sizing, I start every project with this line of code, uh, which is just, hey, everything should have the box sizing of uh, border box. Um, that's a great way to do it. Um, I've seen this approach, and I don't recommend it. Uh, the HTML box sizing border box and then everything inherits from that. There's a reason that we don't inherit margins and backgrounds uh, and padding and layout features. This is a layout feature. It shouldn't be inherited. I want to be able to change it somewhere and not have that change trickle down. The idea behind this was that it helps you create blocks for uh, older code to fit into. Um, you can still do that. You can create a block that uses the old box model, but uh, don't do that globally. So part of avoiding tightly coupled elements, this is a thing that we talk about in terms of components. It's also something that we want in terms of keeping those relationships fluid and moving. We want to avoid tightly coupling uh, so we, we don't get uh, changes. Um, I think that slide was out of order. Didn't that seem out of order? That seemed out of order to me. OK. So in 2011, we got Calc. Calc is really cool, um, and it's super supported. If you aren't using it yet, uh, we've had it for a long time. Um, you can start to mix units in CSS, uh, which was always a pain point. Um, so now we can start playing with how do percentages and pixels stack up together. Um, and then in 2012, we got Flex back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. I'm just going to let you think about that while I take a drink. So Flexbox is cool, and it was a good start. Um, it, does, uh, it gives us lots of power. So here's some things stacking up. Right now I have them wrapping. I can tell them not to wrap. Uh, and then they try to all fit on the same line. Um, you can do vertical centering like I'm doing here. Uh, I can change it uh, from a row to a column. I can change it to column reverse, and they go up instead of down. There's all sorts of things I can do like that. I can have things out of order. Uh, you can see three is out of order uh, because I've set an order on it. There's lots that we can do with Flexbox, but uh, one of the problems is that it still keeps relationships. Um, uh, each, each element defines its own width, which can be problematic sometimes for a layout. Um, we get this sort of global flow where the parent element says what direction things should go. Uh, are they going column or row? Are they going forward or backwards? Um, but then individu they're individually sized. Each element determines its own size. So you still don't have this sort of uh, defining a context of a layout and then putting things into place. Uh, instead, you're defining on each element where it needs to go uh, and what size it needs to be. And that means that you're still tightly coupled. Um, so it's great when we only want to flow in one direction or another, but it's not as great when we want layouts. Um, grow and shrink do give us some ability to define relationships. Uh, they change how things should expand or contract to fill extra space or not enough space. 
Um, but nesting matters a lot. Uh, things are only flex uh, when they are in a flex container. Um, and there's no way of saying uh, this should be a flex element of its grandparent uh, ancestor, um, which I think is limiting. We're going to get tools for that, but they're not available yet. Um, and it, at a page level, it has poor performance because of that uh, aspect where each element is defining its own layout. That means uh, at a page level, we get lots of rewriting, um, and that's not great. So it solved some problems, but not everything. In 2014, we got CSS variables, which I'll show you how those are part of layout. Um, I mean, we had variables before, if you count current color. Um, variables look like this. Uh, they, you define them, they're basically an empty prefix. So we got a browser prefix, and there's, that's not for a specific browser, it's for me. Um, and so that's how we define variables. And then uh, they can have any content in them. They're also called custom properties because they're going to get a lot more power soon. Um, that's all in the works. Uh, to call them, we say uh, we use a variable function similar to the calc function. Um, and we say what, what the variable name is, and then we can provide fallbacks. Anything after the first comma is a fallback, so you can't stack up fallbacks, but you can put something like a font stack that has commas in it in the fallback. Um, but this is, if this property is undefined, we'll fall back to that value, um, which is, uh, you, I think you can actually then put in the fallback, you can say uh, another variable and you can stack those that way. Uh, that doesn't work as fallbacks for browsers that don't support variables because they won't understand the whole line. Um, so that only works as a fallback still for browsers that support. Um, they're different from SAS variables. SAS variables scope to the file structure. So in SAS, if I define a variable inside of the root selector, it is only available inside that specific root selector. It's not available inside a nested class that will be inside of the root. It's not available at a media query. Uh, and then the root selector there, um, it's, it scopes to the file structure the way that you would in JavaScript, um, which is not what we want for CSS, because that's not how CSS works. So CSS variables inherit instead of scoping. Um, so when I define it in the root, it is defined everywhere. And when I change it at a media query, uh, it changes for that element everywhere in that media query. So even if I defined uh, a use for it outside of the media query, um, the value of it will change when we hit that uh, viewport width. Um, and that's, uh, that makes more sense for a lot of the things we're doing in CSS. Um, uh, they also inherit everywhere by default. Uh, no, they don't inherit everywhere by default. Um, you can tell them to inherit everywhere uh, by having them defined on the root, then they will be available everywhere. Uh, and if you want them not to inherit, you can say every element should start with the initial value. Um, and then these won't inherit anymore. Um, you can create safe inline styles with these. You know, inline styles have a very high selector specificity. Uh, they can be very hard to override. But if you need to pass in data from JavaScript or from your server, uh, it can be useful to pass in inline styles. If you want to do that totally safely, you can pass them in as CSS variables, and they won't be used unless you use them. Uh, if you don't want to use them, you just ignore them, and they don't do anything. Uh, so they have, in that sense, no specificity because they don't do anything. Um, so it's totally safe to pass in data that way. Uh, you can also use them to avoid this sort of nesting. Um, I have button, and it's blue, and then I have this button is red. Instead of that, I can say buttons have a background of button color, which is defaults to blue. Uh, and then at this, I can change it to red. And I've kept a single selector in both places. I'm not adding specificity every time I want to change that. Um, so it's a really handy way. If I want an outer element to change something on an inner element, um, I can just sort of do that uh, safely without increasing specificity. Uh, if I start to combine these toys, calc, with uh, variables, I can very quickly build a grid system um, in just a couple lines of code. And uh, that's how it's used. And I can say, I want to span three columns. I want to span six columns. 
um, and it's sort of creating the mix in for itself. Uh, and doing it all internally to CSS, no SAS needed. I got crazy with this because I was like, what, could it work? Could I rebuild Suzy? So I did. Um, I use a whole bunch of these uh, crazy properties, um, each one doing one thing uh, to create uh, Suzy in pure CSS. Um, and it still supports um, all of Suzy's features, including generating that background. Uh, without ever using any SAS. Don't use that either. That is also not worthwhile. Um, basically, you only need one layout. Suzy is built to handle all the layouts. You don't need something built to handle all the layouts. You need one layout. Um, so uh, another thing you can play with is viewport units. These give you things like full height. Uh, the, the viewport height would be the full screen. Um, you can do sticky footers with a min height of the of 100 VH. Uh, VH basically works as a percentage of the viewport. Um, you can break out of the container by combining percentages with viewport units. Uh, and then in 2017, we got Jetpacks, which is CSS Grid. And it really landed in all of the browsers over one weekend in 2017, all of the browsers except IE. Um, and it was, it was like I left work on Friday, and it was unsupported anywhere. And I went back to work on Monday, and it was supported in the majority of the browsers we use. Um, and it really is supported in most places. There's nothing like it at all. Uh, if anybody claims that they are uh, doing what Grid does, it's not true. Um, if anybody's saying that it's like tables, that's not true. Uh, there is absolutely nothing like it. The spec can be very complex if you try to read through it. Um, but there's a lot of ways to get started very simply. It does give us truly two-dimensional layouts, not just 12 columns across. Um, and it allows us to mix units. So we can define um, the template columns. We can define the template rows. We can use different units. We can use this uh, min-max um, to say it should uh, be a minimum of one width and a maximum of another width. Uh, and it will figure out what space is left. We have fraction units work similarly to uh, the grow and shrink values in uh, Flexbox. Uh, they allow you to uh, dole up the remaining space. Um, and we can quickly do this. Uh, and I'll just inspect it quick to show uh, a lot of dev tools, especially Firefox, have ways of looking at a grid. You can see. This grid uh, is given numbered index lines. Um, and you can lay out on those lines. Um, I've also given it named areas. Um, and then it's negative 1 indexed uh, if you want to lay things out from the reverse. Um, there's a lot you can do there. So laying things out by line. Uh, we can do uh, layout from one line to another, or we can start at one line and span a certain number, or we can lay out uh, to negative numbers. We get various options. Um, we can we get global flow and sizing. So everything is defined in one place unless we pass it back to the element with auto. Auto says get the size from the element, um, but otherwise we can define it all in one place, which is handy. Um, we get these named areas, which are basically defined using this ASCII art of our website, um, which is super handy uh, because we can then change the ASCII art somewhere and the entire layout changes. If we've defined uh, where we want, what we want to be the, in the header block, what we want to be in the nav block, uh, and then we just change the ASCII art at different um, sizes, uh, that will all change. I'll show you that. Uh, so let's inspect this again and look at the grid and then change those sizes. So these things are laid out to header, nav, main, and footer and below a certain width. We changed the ASCII art uh, and they just all line up in a column. Um, and we can do that as many times as we need to to create as many layouts as we need to um, for those blocks. Uh, if you're getting confused at all between percentages, viewport widths, and fractions, uh, this is just a quick guide. 
Uh, they all work in a similar way, um, but percentages are relative to the parent width. Viewport width is relative to the viewport as a whole. And uh, fractions are relative to available space. Um, so that's a quick way of thinking about them. Um, one fraction, there's a little bit of a gotcha with it. Uh, when you say something should be one fraction, by default, the browsers understand that as min-max auto one fraction, which means they will grow and not shrink. Uh, so you, if you actually want things to be able to shrink as well as grow, you have to say that explicitly. Use min-max zero one fraction uh, to say that. Um, so this last year, Jen Simmons announced that we are moving past responsive web design. We're now talking about intrinsic web design. And what that means is that we can start mixing fixed and fluid instead of always doing fluid. Um, we have stages of squishiness. These are the four stages. We can have fixed elements, fluid elements using fractions, uh, fluid until fixed using min max or flex basis, uh, and then items that are actually just using their automatic flow, uh, which we can assign using auto. So suddenly we're mixing all of these into a single layout, which is totally new for us. Um, we can start nesting these contexts, so nothing has to go away. I heard one teacher telling their students never to use floats now, they're old. Um, that's like never using tables even for data, which I remember when people did that. Um, so we don't have to ditch any of these. They're all useful together. We can nest them together uh, and keep using them for their different uh, use cases. Um, we can uh, expand and contract to content. We have justify, we have wrap, we have flex all these different ways of handling how we move based on the content and the space available. Uh, we can use media queries as needed. Uh, and I can show you a quick sample of that. Um, actually, on my slide tool here, uh, if you change the sizes, it automatically figures out. And this is uh, just telling it the minimum and maximum for each slide. It automatically figures out how many columns we need without any breakpoints. Um, the browser is just doing that itself. Uh, so media queries are becoming uh, only necessary in certain situations. And then we can start playing with data-driven layouts. Uh, I just had this idea. We were working on a new project for a client. And I thought, well, what happens if I just pass in some of the data? We're trying to do a uh, scheduling tool. And so I set up a grid that had a grid column for every minute of the day. Turns out you only get enough grid columns for about 16 and a half hours, but that was enough. Um, and we just set in a start time and a duration for each event, and we immediately had a schedule. Uh, and it lays out, and it even fills in the gaps if we ask it to, uh, and all of that just passing in those two values uh, as CSS custom properties then used directly by grid. Um, so then I started playing with that more. I thought, well, OK, we can do bar charts, and we can figure out how it relates to the total value. And so we've got these bar charts um, that are totally uh, including the colors. Everything is determined just by uh, a total um, and a calc. Um, and then I was like, OK, we got line graphs. That's something we might need. Uh, so I built line graphs. Uh, that you know generate some random data, and then I was like, okay, let's plot some things, generate that data uh, with an X, Y, and Z. Um, and then I saw this piece of art, and I was like, that's just some grids and some uh, generated variables. So um, let's build that, add a few of these in, and then go into kick-ass battle mode, and we can start to shoot them because grid invaders. So that's important, <laughs> very, very important, I would say. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to find out more about variables, Leah Veru is a great source. She has some good talks online. Um, for grids, Rachel Andrew has Grid by Example, which gives not just examples, but also common templates and fallbacks for older browsers. Uh, and you can basically just copy and paste. Um, my slides are all online, and I've tweeted them, so you can uh, find these. Uh, Jen Simmons has Layout Land, uh, where she gives lots of trainings on uh, grids and various other new toys. And uh, just remember that CSS is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam.
I kind of want to like go straight into Q&A, but can we just like take a second to appreciate how amazing Miriam's like highlight pointer thingy is? <laughs> I like completely lost track of the slide because I was like, what? Is <laughs> what is happening? What, what is that? That is amazing. It's the Logitech Spotlight. Huh. Look at that. Logitech. Still doing cool stuff. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I probably. hope so. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions for Miriam? Yeah. Wow. Oh, there. Yeah. Uh, the slide link is down here if anybody needs it. Uh, also on Twitter. Go ahead. Um, can I now make a box with text that dynamically fills the box? Uh, no. Scales it? Uh, well, so there are ways that you can get close to that using viewport units to set your font size uh, if you know the relationship between your box and the viewport. Yeah. Um, otherwise, no. OK. Oh, one more. Is there any um, plans for IE to support this as well? The, for the what's grid, that? The grid part, for IE to support the grid part? Yeah, uh, we assume they're coming along. <laughs> Um, they just haven't yet. I think it's actually already supported in Edge, uh, and, and IE has an older implementation of it, um, so they have started, um, but you know, IE 10, 11 will never quite catch up, and it'll all happen in Edge. But if you're using Electron, everything is supported. Uh, what about people who are, who are um, not going to get that deep in CSS? And I've played with Bootstrap. And is, is Bootstrap a particularly offensive uh, framework? Or is that a, a good place to start? Or is there something that's better that, so the that only, incorporates some of this kind of off the shelf? Um, I, I tried to figure out if I could build a grid system around grids. And there's just no point. Like grids, if you figure out the basics of grids, it does what it does better than anybody could build a framework around it. Um, if you are using old frameworks, Bootstrap is as fine as any of them. Uh, the main problem with Bootstrap is it's popular, and so all the sites look the same. Um, and so do you consider that offensive? That's up to you. Um, Flexbox was incredibly broken between browser implementations in the beginning. Uh, is CSS Grid more solid out of the box? Uh, CSS Grid, in my experience, has been very solid uh, unless you're trying to port to the old IE syntax. And then there's quite a few differences there. Um, but that's all behind browser flags um, or uh, uh, properties. Um, so uh, I haven't seen major issues across Firefox, Chrome, and the others. And Firefox announced yesterday that they're, they've added animation of grid properties. Uh, so that's in Firefox nightly as of, I think, yesterday. Do you have any knowledge of where we're at with subgrids? Oh, I, it's, everybody is asking for it. Um, and it is what will make this perfect. Um, nobody has implemented it yet. So it seems to be at the front of everybody's minds, and we don't know exactly when somebody will actually launch it. All right. With that, we're going to go into a coffee break, right? Uh, because I definitely need a coffee, so we're all getting a coffee. That's the new rule. Um, we're going to continue this party at 3 PM um, with you know, more talks about performance and the last two talks for the day before we open up the bar, which I know is like what most of you are actually here for. Um, but until then, we'll just have a little coffee break and like a few snacks that are being brought out just now. So, you know, energize it up. Thank you, Miriam.